preparing to speak. Good morning and welcome to the second webinar in the Net Zero series from UK Research and Innovation. I'm Chris Akan, Innovation Lead for the Future Flight Challenge, and we'll be chairing today's Net Zero Sustainable Transport Panel. The UK has pledged to cut emissions by 75% by 2035 and to be net zero by 2050. In this series, we're looking at how innovation, collaboration and engagement will, be, will come together to help achieve our net zero ambitions, tackle wider climate change and build a more sustainable future. We'll be shedding light on the work already undertaken by the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund programme to address the key challenges that will help the UK build back greener. We're bringing together world-renowned researchers and innovators across all our funding disciplines to discuss the need for innovative solutions to heat our homes, travel to work, develop and transform our industries, cater to our diets, enjoy our leisure time and prosper from a cleaner, healthier environment whilst growing our economy. Today, we are focusing on sustainable transport and how we can move from place to place in greener ways using new classes of electric, hydrogen and autonomous vehicles. Each of our panelists will give a short presentation on their area of expertise. And what, then we'll discuss how these new transport methods will change how we connect people, how we deliver goods and how we provide services. If you'd like to ask any of us a question, please use the Q&A function, not the chat box. Uh, first up, we've got uh, Evelyn Lee, a project manager at Community Energy Scotland for the Reflex Orkney project. Her focus has been on setting up community transport from car hub to demand responsive vehicle services. She co-authored the Orkney Electric Vehicle Strategy 2018 to 2023 and has been driving EVs for over five years. Evelyn has a Master's of Engineering degree in Electrical and, and Electronic Engineering from Imperial College London and years of experience working on innovative projects aiming to increase flexibility within electricity networks. I'll now invite Evelyn to present. Um, thank you, Carissa. Brilliant. Um, so yeah, as, as Carissa says, uh, I'm Evelyn uh, and a project manager for Community Energy Scotland. Um, and I will be talking about uh, sustainable transport through my lens, uh, which is working on a smart local energy system demonstrator project uh, called Reflex uh, in Orkney, uh, which is where I live and work. So can I get the next slide, please? Thank you. So as a bit more context, uh, Orkney is a group of islands off the north coast of Scotland with a population of 21,000. We have more than 30 public EV chargers, uh, which are serving over 280 electric vehicles out of closer to 11,500 cars and vans. Um, we don't have any train systems, uh, but ferries and planes are our lifelines. Um, Orkney generates over 100% of our electrical demand uh, renewably. Uh, however, this only accounts for about 20% of our energy use. And so we actually have one of the worst carbon footprints as well as one of the worst fuel poverty rates per local um, authority area in Scotland. So we do have some um, big things to tackle there within Orkney. So can I get the next slide, please? So as part of the Reflex Orkney, uh, the project aims around sustainable transport are really um, to decarbonize the energy system by reducing the need for fossil fuels for transport uh, and maximizing the use of uh, renewable generation that we have. Uh, we want to use sort of transport assets to provide electrical flexibility and making transport uh, generally as accessible as possible. Also, as this is a demonstrator project, we really want to learn what works and what doesn't. So uh, the Reflex project is developing an integrated energy system to combine transport, heat and electricity, uh, along with renewable generation uh, and use a control platform called FlexiGrid uh, to manage real time actions of various different assets. So I could talk about electrical flexibility, uh, what that is, how it could help uh, electrical network operators manage the uptake in electric vehicles. But um, in, these, in this short little presentation, I just want to focus on access to transport. So can I get the next slide, please? 
So it doesn't matter how great uh, your low carbon transport technology is if no one can access it to actually get the benefits of it. So in any sustainable transport model, uh, multiple ways to access travel have to be taken into consideration. So I've listed just five access models here, um, one of which we're probably more familiar with, which is buying uh, an EV outright. Uh, and doing that might be a lower cost option over sort of its lifetime um, compared to a, a petrol or a diesel car. However, the upfront cost of an EV, uh, like a new EV compared to a, a secondhand petrol or a diesel um, is, is huge. So um, that isn't feasible for everybody at, at this point in time. Uh, public transport uh, will also need to decarbonize, um, but that, that isn't part of the scope of, of Reflex. Um, so within Reflex, we're focusing on car clubs, community run transport uh, and leasing uh, as ways for people to access low carbon cars and vans. So can I get the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, we've supported island communities uh, to own and operate electric vehicles as part of their sort of day to day uh, and help residents get around uh, that may not be able to drive um, or, or want to. So we discovered that while there are sort of 12 plus um, seater EV minibuses, that actually multiple smaller EVs were preferred by three of the island communities that we've worked with. Um, so it allows them more flexibility when it comes to operating the services that they provide. So a smaller vehicle is better for accessing properties that are um, sort of at the end of a long, narrow or a, a bumpy access road. Um, and uh, th these smaller or multiple smaller vehicles give more confidence to those that are, that are running them that if the battery is low on one of them, they can use the other uh, while, while the first one's charging. Or even you can actually use both vehicles for totally different trips at the same time. And often, um, the services that, that they're providing, a smaller vehicle would be okay, but there is that, you know, few times in a year when actually they, they would have needed a, a larger vehicle. Um, so each island group decided to go with two ENV 200s. Um, so one's a seven seater and one a five seater with wheelchair access. Uh, you can see the ramp in the, the top right picture uh, and that folds away um, and it, so it actually doubles up as a very large boot uh, for deliveries of goods rather than people. Um, and that was really helpful during the first lockdown. Uh, the vehicles that were deployed really helped the community uh, to be able to deliver necessary um, things like food and medicines. Uh, it's also given the communities a chance to gap fill and supplement statutory or council services. So now that um, kids are back at school, uh, some of the vehicles are actually being used as school buses. So this is an access model that's, that's really flexible to meet the needs of the community. Next slide, please. So another model we're using is electric car clubs. Um, so as part of the project, we've contracted uh, co wheels to run two car club locations um, alongside the three that were set up in Orkney uh, just before the pandemic. So co wheels car club is a pay as you go electric car hire scheme. Um, there's no upfront cost if joining as part of the reflex project and it's just four pound 13 per hour to hire. There aren't reams of paperwork to fill out every time you want to book an EV uh, and there's no key swapping as you access the car via a smart card. So it is a, a bit different to sort of a more traditional car hire um, scheme. Both the locations that we, we've put in place are close to ferry terminals uh, that connect the outer and inner Orkney Islands. Uh, and we're hoping that this will reduce the need for taking the car across on the ferry um, or even for having a car parked on sort of mainland Orkney um, for use. Uh, we're also really interested to see if uh, there are behavior changes in Orkney around car ownership. So there's already evidence um, uh, across the UK that where there is a car club, um, there's actually an increased uptake of active travel and also a reduction in car ownership. And reducing the number of vehicles manufactured, regardless of their fuel type, uh, will help reduce carbon emissions. Next slide, please. Thanks. So the final access model I want to talk about is leasing. So this greatly reduces one of the main barriers to running an EV, which is that upfront cost. So in this model, there is still an upfront cost in the order of a thousand pounds, but that's significantly less than buying it outright would be. Um, and then you have monthly payments uh, for the duration of the lease. 
to, to cover the cost. We also had the expertise of a, a local secondhand EV salesman uh, whose mantra is bums on seats. Uh, and so the project has been offering test drives for a handful of EV models listed there, which has been really welcome. Um, and a high percentage of those test drives have resulted in requests for quotes to lease vehicles. So doing all of this under varying lockdown restrictions has been quite difficult um, and test drives had to be suspended for quite a while, but it has shown a correlation between being able to test drive an EV to actually being confident enough to get one. Uh, thank you. Cheers. Thank you, Evie. So I'll open up um, the discussion now and ask you a few questions. So um, what charging infrastructure is needed for these different access models? Mm -hmm. So um, for the, the EV leasing that I've just described there, the sort of preference is to have smart charging at home. Um, so through the Reflex project, we're, we're helping those that do have off-street parking um, and have permission from the property owner to use the OZEV and um, EST grants that are available in Scotland to reduce the cost of that installation. Mm -hmm. However, not everyone is going to be able to have off-street parking or permission or even just the money to do that straight away. So the, the public EV charging that's already in Orkney uh, can be used. Um, and while it's not going to meet everybody's needs um, and there will be <laughs> chargers needed in, in other locations, um, it's not part of, of the Reflex project scope, but the local authority has been doing a fantastic job in, in getting EV chargers installed generally, uh, which is why we've already got 30 of them. So th there'll be some more years of, of that needing to roll out, I think. Um, and then for the community electric vehicles, um, uh, we're putting in EV chargers that are ranging from uh, sort of seven kilowatts to a three phase 22 kilowatt charger. Um, and those groups are, are making a call as to whether they want that to be available to the, the public as well, sort of depending on the, the existing infrastructure there and also what their needs are for, for the vehicle service um, that they are providing. And then the car clubs, uh, so they have sort of home locations. So that's where the car um, is sort of kept when people aren't booking it. And each of those have seven kilowatt um, chargers or, or higher in, in other places. Um, so, so it can be charging while it's not being booked. And then each car also has a charge place Scotland or a charger car card uh, to actually be able to charge on the public infrastructure in Scotland, which is predominantly charge place Scotland. So that's that's quite handy in Scotland. I know that's not the case in the rest of the UK. Mm, OK, thank you. And so is there any support um, from the Reflux? Uh, Orkney project for people who want an EV? Yeah, so um, we've set up an EV support package um, for leasing. So it's sort of been tailored to, um, to meet one of the main reasons that we hear from people in Orkney um, for not getting an EV, which is, will it get me to Inverness? Um, which, so that's just a few hundred miles um, south after you, <laughs> after you get on the ferry. So as part of that support package, um, people can actually hire a, a longer range EV and, you know, have have the right to, to do that for a decent um, uh, amount of time um, if, if they're not comfortable in taking their own EV down. So it's just sort of like that, that peace of mind that actually, yes, you can you can get south if, if, you, if you're worried on doing it um, first in your own car. Um, and then to make sure that that continues beyond the project, um, it, there's actually set up a, a special purpose vehicle or a new business uh, called Reflex Orkney Limited to make sure that that continues uh, beyond the, the project. Okay, fantastic, thanks. Um, okay, so I'll move on now to our next speaker, Dan Piner. So Dan is an innovation lead for rail at Innovate UK. He is part of the rail team. He represents the interest of the rail industry uh, within Innovate UK and delivers a number of innovation competitions on behalf of the lead customer organization including the Department for Transport, Network Rail and High Speed 2. Dan previously worked at the Transport Strategy Centre, Imperial College London, as a senior benchmarking manager. In this role, Dan was project manager of the International Suburban Rail Benchmarking Group and Flirt Optimization and Innovation Group. Uh, Dan, I'll invite you to present to him. Thanks. Thank you, Carissa, and good morning, everyone. Uh, 
as Carissa said, my name is Dan Piner and I am a rail innovation leader at Innovate UK. So our role at Innovate UK uh, in the rail team is to deliver competitions on behalf of the De Department for Transport, Network Rail and High Speed 2 in order to drive innovation in the rail industry. I'm really pleased to be here this morning and over the next few minutes I'm just going to present a small number of slides illustrating rail's current position in terms of carbon emissions and then uh, a bit about some of the expected journey towards net zero. So next slide please. My overall message today is that rail has a huge part to play in achieving net zero. There are two aspects to this. The first is that rail is already a relatively green form of transport and so attracting more passengers to rail is crucial in reduce, reducing emissions from other modes. This graph uh, on the side now shows the estimated emissions of carbon dioxide by transport mode from 1990 to 2018. As you can see, rail is already a strong performer, making up just 1.4% of UK transport's CO2 emissions in 2018. And secondly, rail then needs to consider how to fully decarbonize in terms of the rolling stock, but also stations, infrastructure, the supply chain, and even customers connecting journeys, the first and last mile. This is going to be a gradual process between now and 2050, but one that needs to start straight away. Next slide, please. To give a bit of further context to the previous graph, uh, I just ask you to look at the middle pie chart on this slide, which shows that uh, for, for the 1.4 percent of the transport sector's CO2 emissions, which rail um, is responsible for, rail delivers 10 percent of the passenger distances travelled uh, within the UK. So rail here is shown in the dark green, um, and we can see that compared to other modes, rail is already relatively green. And, and so rail's journey to net zero is starting from a really good base point. The more we can increase rail, rail's modal share, then the quicker we can reduce transport's overall CO2 emissions. Next slide, please. However, as everyone is aware, COVID-19 has had a profound impact on transport demand and travel patterns. Rail dropped as low as to about 5% of typical patronage during the first lockdown. And even now we're only back up in the region of about 40% of passengers. This is due to a combination of people staying local and not traveling for work or leisure uh, as directed by government, but also a shift to private cars for many that were still making journeys. Govern government messaging was to avoid public transport and the car was seen as a form of PPE for those that did travel by protecting them from exposure to COVID-19. I could make a tongue in cheek comment that this is fantastic news. Net zero would of course be much easier to achieve if we didn't have any uh, passengers to move, but clearly uh, this is not the way that we want to get there. The rail industry is hopeful that patronage will increase, but we acknowledge it will not likely take a number of years to return to pre-pandemic levels. Current forecasts suggest that by 2025, we'll probably be around about 80% of pre-pandemic patronage. This creates some interesting challenges in terms of achieving net zero, particularly in relation to investment in rolling stock and infrastructure on the back of significant government debt and the subsidies that government has been providing to the rail industry, but also the need to shift travel behaviours to encourage the use of public transport. A big part of this over the next few months will be through information and education. So trying to break those habits that people have um, developed of drive-in places instead of taking rail and to reassure potential passengers that rail is in fact COVID safe. Next slide, please. I also wanted to emphasize that rail isn't all about the movement of people and the movement of goods is a really important part of the industry. Indeed, freight has a huge role to play in achieving net zero, particularly as rail already emits about 25% of the CO2 emissions of road freight when we normalize it by a uh, tonne kilometer. However, rail freight is typically diesel powered, so there's certainly action that can be taken to make it cleaner, but the potential here is clear. To link this to my previous slide, we should also acknowledge that if passenger numbers do not increase as quickly as hoped, then freight may be able to take advantage of the increased number of freight paths on the network. So this has happened to some extent through the pandemic. Uh, we saw last year that fewer passenger services led to some opportunities for longer freight trains on more direct paths. Next slide, please. Moving forwards, the government has set out plans to achieve net zero in rail by 2050. The main milestone to achieve this, achieve this is the removal of passenger and freight diesel trains by 2040 or 2035 for passenger services in Scotland. So 29% of the UK's rolling stock and 62% of the network is diesel powered. And that makes this a really ambitious target. 
So the average lifespan of a train is around 25 to 30 years. And this clearly uh, precludes any new diesel powered rolling stock being procured if we had to meet this target. Assuming the current diesel fleet is replaced over the next 19 years, there is an urgent need to either invest in increased electrification or alternative power sources, such as hydrogen, battery and hybrid trains. Interestingly, the government's targets of removing diesel trains by 2040 doesn't actually include uh, diesel uh, hybrids. So, for example, diesel electric trains such as the GWR Class 800s, which have been in, an, in the news a lot recently uh, for very different reasons over the last couple of weeks. Um, so it's recognised that these diesel electric hybrid trains may be an important first step towards decarbonisation and to getting us to net zero. Next slide, please. So this is my final slide, and it outlines that the characteristics of the services and network are a key factor in the choice of power source. Electrification has a clear advantage in terms of being a proven technology in rail and versatile in terms of the types of services it can be used for. It remains the only feasible low carbon option for higher speed, long distance and freight services. And it's therefore critical that a rolling pro program of electrification commences urgently in order to smooth the transition to net zero. Hydrogen and battery do not yet have the power needed for freight or higher speed passenger services, but they may well prove useful for running on parts of the network which are unelectrified, for example, due to cost, infrastructure, constraints and shorter branch lines. We feel that they will um, be, be in a position to to provide, uh, a, a, provide uh, an opportunity in some places which electrification can't reach. So in conclusion, rail is starting from a strong place in targeting net zero. It's already a clean form of transport relative to other modes and the challenge lies in both urgently investing in alternatives to diesel and also in attracting passengers back to rail from other modes post pandemic. This is where innovation is absolutely key as it will be required in order to drive down costs and also to make rail the mode of choice for passengers. Thank you for your time and I'll now, now hand back over to Carissa. Thank you, Dan. Um, so uh, is there anything more that the rail industry can do to maximize its contribution to net zero? Uh, yeah, good question. So um, as I mentioned in my presentation, we feel that rail is already a relatively green form of transport and we're in a good position, but there's definitely more that can be done and, and more that can be done to maximize contribution to net zero. The key here is really to try and attract people to rail post pandemic. Um, so customers that used to travel by rail have now switched to uh, car or other modes and also uh, new, new passengers that perhaps uh, haven't taken rail or don't consistently take rail previously, maybe for leisure journeys, for example. Um, perhaps particularly with the rise of the staycation and, and domestic uh, holidays, there might be more opportunity there. And the best ways to do this, we feel, are going to be through affordable and attractive pricing, a really positive customer experience. So perhaps thinking about what the customer wants in terms of um, flexibility, uh, sort of leisure options, sort of maybe you know food and drink on the trains, etc. The the station experience as well, and and also considering what more can be done for the first and last mile journeys. So how is the passenger getting to the station and how are they getting from the station to their destination? Okay. Um, and yeah, that's going to be a really crucial part of making sure rail is, uh, is part of the bigger picture in net zero. Thanks. And so um, how is Innovate UK helping to support rail's move to net zero? Yeah, we feel at Innovate UK uh, in the rail team, we are delivering a number of competitions on behalf of the Department for Transport, Network Rail and High Speed 2. And uh, some of our recent competitions, for example, First of a Kind uh, 3, and which was a couple of years ago, and First of a Kind 2020, and our most re recent competition, First of a Kind 2021, have all included decarbonisation or greener railway or low cost electrification as part of the themes. Um, so this is a uh, department for transport funding for projects to uh, for them to explore some of these uh, areas in particular and and in the past we've funded a number of uh, innovative projects such as Gvolution, Hydroflex, Steamology, um, Viverel as well which are looking at alternatives to traditional uh, power sources in, in, in the form of hydrogen battery etc. Okay, I see. Thank you, Dan. Um, so I'll move on to our next speaker. 
Um, uh, so Onyx Dika Oyebola is the batteries program manager for the Fire Day Battery Challenge, uh, where she supports in the management and delivery of the industrial R&D portfolio. Uh, prior to joining Innovate UK, she worked as a project manager at Microsoft UK on their Microsoft Dynamics CRM, managing the marketing uh, projects across 25 countries and in defining and executing a charter related to the different activities needed to execute the project. Her background is in mathematics. I'll now welcome her to present. Thank you very much, Clarissa. Yeah, thank you very much. Good morning, all, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Oye Bola Bello, and I'm the program manager of Batteries. Um, I'll be spending the next few minutes to talk about government strategy towards net zero and what Friday Battery Challenge is doing in achieving this target and how it all fits together. Next slide, please. So this graph shows the recommended six carbon budget, which, which has now been um, set to law. And this follows the um, June 2019, when UK became the first major economy in the world to pass law to end its contribution to global warming by 2050. And this target will require um, the UK to bring all the greenhouse gas emission to net zero by 2050. So the question is, how are we going to achieve this? Um, next slide, please. So looking at the first graph, um, within the Faraday Battery Challenge, the part that we are most interested in is the orange portion, which is the electrification segment. And this clearly shows that electrification is required, how much ele electrification is required in getting to net zero. And you can see the light purple showing adaptation and efficiency also shows how much dependent we are on electrification and the technology required to reach um, net zero. On the second graph, it shows more detail on the different sectors, um, de um, sectors decarbonized at um, different rates. And as you can see, the surface um, transport in purple is the biggest segment on the electrification agenda and equally one of the most difficult areas to decarbonize in surface transport. So from the map, we're really clear on the route to get to, um, to, to net zero. And the, the, the scene is now set and it is obvious that battery will play a key role in getting there. So what has the challenge been doing in achieving the target towards net zero? Next slide, please. So we make a lot of cars in the UK, and if we are going to make more electric um, vehicles, we need more batteries. This graph shows the projected um, demand for UK batteries, and as you can see, there is a significant economic opportunity here. As of today, the UK battery manufacturing capacity demand is two um, gigawatt hour. However, if you look at the faded dotted line on the graph, this is projected to rise steadily year on year. And by year 2035, the projection is that the UK um, battery demand, passenger cars only, will be around 100 gigawatt hour, which represents about 8 billion of business in battery manufacturing and supply chain. So the point of Faraday Battery Challenge is to put in place a research, innovation, and scale up activities within the UK aimed at making UK the go-to place for batteries. And in, order, and in order to be more specific, there are a number of targets that need to be complied with. And these are the targets that will use the cost, energy density, power density. And these are what we use in driving research, innovation, and scale up within the challenge. Next slide, please. I'll just talk a little bit more about what Faraday program is all about for those who are not familiar with it. So the challenge was launched back in 2017, initially a four year program to support design, develop and manufacture of batteries for electric vehicles. We recently secured an increase to the program, which now represents an investment of 318 million to March 2022. So there's been a lot of activity in the last four years. And on the research um, side at Faraday Institution, we committed over 100 million. And we have nine major multi-institutions, 
multidisciplinary research program addressing battery related scientific challenges at scale. Of the 318 million mentioned earlier, um, we've committed around about 90 million to the CR collaborative um, CRMD. And these are business led consortia, and we're backing great UK um, collaborations to bring cutting edge solutions to the market, as well as building capabilities around the value chain. We've had three rounds of competitions with 64 projects across 124 funded organizations within the UK. And we're expecting to announce the winners of our recent round four competitions shortly. The third element of the challenge is the delivery of the UK Battery Industrialization Center. This sits in a ton scale where manufacturing process can be developed at industrial um, rate. UK Vic is critical is a critical element of the program and uh, uh, because it helps both large and small organizations develop their technology at scale in a, in a giga factory capability within an open access manufacturing development facility. Next slide, please. So other activity we do as a team outside the funding, we, we're working together with a huge range of organizations, um, academia and all different, uh, all different um, government departments. And one of our key partner is the Advanced Proportion Center. And this relationship is really working well. We're beginning to have a joint approach and voice. And there are many more people now talking, now connected on battery than ever before. And with this power of collaboration, the UK is getting noticed internationally in this space. One of our USP in the UK in sustainable battery is that we know and understand how we can create true net zero battery. So as part of what we do, we're working across community, um, supply chain and government to ensure net environmental and societal gains. We're also working with the city to amplify Faraday investment through investor programs and showcases. Actually, we recently concluded a successful investor program back in um, April, organized by KTN, and this has proven very valuable to our community. And there has been great feedbacks and good connections as a result. We also do a lot of work with UK um, skill work stream. And actually, a big part of this is how we codify. And we recently commissioned the BSI, um, British Standard Institute, to develop a suite of passes, which has now been launched. Next slide, please. So looking into the future towards transitioning to net zero. It's now apparent that battery electrification will play a key role in reaching the target of net zero, among other applications. And that electrification is no longer just about passenger cars, which was originally the economic argument to the volume, due to, due to volume. It has to reach all other forms of transport as well. However, as different sectors come on board, there will be different requirements and priorities, ranging from energy density, power density, lifetime and cost, of course, which will equally require different solutions. I'm happy to say that there was a piece of work that has just been completed by WMG to develop target performance cluster and strategic um, priorities. The reports grouped together different applications with similar um, battery requirements as a way to simplify how we meet the needs of different sector in electrification. And the output of this report will help shape research agenda and enable cross-sector collaboration. And to further ensure cross-sector collaboration, KTN has recently launched a cross-sector battery innovation network, and we're beginning to see so many activity and collaboration across various sectors. In conclusion, um, within the Faraday Battery Challenge, we've made very good progress in the last four years. However, with, with the commitment to net zero by 2050, and of course with electrification cutting across other sectors in transport, this poses new challenges and more opportunities for the UK. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you.
Okay, so um, where does the UK sit in the global battery stage? Thank you very much, Teresa. That's a very interesting question. From what we know today, uh, today at the moment, most, most of the large scale manufacturers are in China and Korea. We do have EU manufacturing um, also growing as well. UK is quite behind, a bit behind. However, the demand for battery is growing, so we will need many more batteries. And there is an, uh, there is an ambition to manufacture at scale in the UK. We're doing a lot of work on the research, uh, research side as well. UK has leading universities working in this space. And one of the things that we're focusing on in Faraday is making sure that the research and innovation happening in the UK reaches the market. So, yeah, that's where we are. Okay, thanks. And so do you think there would be enough, will there be enough uh, charging points for the rise in demand of electric vehicles? Yeah, I, I believe so. <laughs> um, yeah, this is another key area of investment and a number of char um, char charging points is increasing all the time. Um, we are aware that there are some oil and gas companies looking at installing um, network charging infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And obviously, I will be happy to link anyone up with one of my colleagues um, who is the innovation um, lead for EV charging, working with, with OZEF. And she is actually in charge of that particular um, area. We, there is a lot of work going on in that space as well. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Okay, so I'll move on to our next presenter, uh, Oscar Morgan. So Oscar is the head of product for Pure Electric, uh, the UK's largest specialist micro EV retailer, having previously worked on future transport concept design at Williams Advanced Engineering across the automotive, aerospace, and micromobility sectors. Oscar, I welcome you to present. Thanks. Thank you, Carissa, and good morning, everyone. Um, thank you to the uh, UKRI and to Dawn and to Mark for having me along today. The way I've constructed this, there should be about one point per slide, which I'm hoping people to take away and I'll guide everyone towards that. On this one, it's just my email address. Uh, head of product, head of design strategy, I'm supporting Pure in technical development. So could we go to the next slide, please, Mark? Okay, so a year ago when I gave talks like this, I had to start by sort of leveling up everyone as to what micromobility actually was. And one of the great luxuries now, just 12 months later, on almost every street corner in you know, 50 or 60 local authorities, there's a voy or a lime or a bird or a, a zip or a barrel or a dot. And that means that now I, I have the luxury of starting with an introduction to who Pure are. Uh, for anyone who's unaware, this is a relentless little UK based company that's rapidly expanding into Europe completely specialized in electric micromobility. So the product range consists solely of uh, e-scooters, e-bikes, some e-cargo. And over the last 24 months, it's gone from effectively the founder, um, Adam Norris, through to, uh, sorry, in the region of 250 people across four different countries, across uh, heading, for, heading for 30 stores. And is now certainly the UK's leading specialist in this sector. Um, could we go to the next slide, please? So it's a good title, the, the towards, towards Sustainable. I enjoyed that because effectively, there's, there's lots of different ways that micromobility can contribute to this particular journey. And some of them are local environment, so how it affects the pollution, how it affects you know, in, in your city, um, and that's emissions beyond just what comes out the tailpipe. It's the fact that a lightweight vehicle puts out a, a lot less of, of the related emissions to cars and trucks and buses and so forth. But really, on this slide, the one thing that I wanted to, to highlight was around rate of consumption. So, so if you, I know fundamentals have got quite, I think, fashionable recently since Elon started talking about them. When you go back to the fundamentals, the least efficient e-scooter consumes about 15 watt hours per kilometer. And, and the most efficient 
EV, automobile, consumes about 150. So without even trying, you are, you are requiring a tenth, an order of magnitude less energy to get a scooter or an e-bike or even e-cargo down the road. And, and in a way, electrification, it boils down to sort of three almost key elements. One's around uptake, obviously. How do we create a frictionless experience? And it was really gratifying when Dan earlier was talking about trains, was talking about the last mile, this area where suddenly pure and electric micromobility becomes relevant. But then also um, the, the, the efficiency of the motor is always so good. And, and, and the, the fact that the energy can be sus sustainably sourced, all of that's well and good, but, but you have to minimize the rate of consumption regardless, because we don't live in a, a world of infinite abundance yet. We don't yet have renewables generating an endless supply. And, and this is where micro really, really swings hard. Can we go to the next slide, please? So one of the things that I find fascinating is when we talk about sustainability, so often we actually abstract it from what I perceive the majority of people really care about, and that's their, their local environment. So, so one of the ways in which I feel very positive about micro and why I enjoy waking up is that as I said earlier, in the, in the macro, it reduces that overall consumption, reduces the overall emissions. But in the micro, it, it is a lot easier in some ways for people to connect that macro impact to their local, the micro impact, which is you know, a, 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 a sort of perceivable reduction in local emissions. And that's also in a weird way, we talk a lot about sustainability, we talk a lot about pollution, the two become intermingled. And, and, and one of those th the things I find interesting is, is the perception of, of space. It's not really rely, aligned to sustainability, but it is aligned to uptake. And that is that, that, that even a city full of electric cars is still a city full of cars. And one of the things that I feel very excited about each time I see a scooter, if we just park the illegality of it for a second, it's, it's that there's a vehicle taking up a 50th of the road space and there's a sustainable solution that reduction in consumption of, of our city, of the, of the physical city, always feels really positive to me. Can we go to the next slide, please? So just, again, I'm sure that to the, or I suspect that to the participants on this call, um, this is not news, but why is this happening now? Why is it not being uptaken earlier? And this is really technology is the enabler and it, it aligns into Faraday Challenge and so forth the reduction in cost and the improvement in performance of the fundamental electrical components, that is the direct drive motors and the lithium ion batteries, means that suddenly form factors, which even 10 years ago were either very, very expensive or really ineffective and unsatisfactory to use are now fantastic ways to, to transport yourself. And, and really that's why we've been seeing this spike over the last three to four years. It's a genuine improvement. Next slide, please. So finally, I guess this is what I'll leave you guys on. It's a bit of a, a call to action, I suppose. Almost by accident, the UK has not been at the forefront of this, and it's on account of our legality. Ironically, China, who produced sort of 98% of the technology or something in this sector, a huge proportion, it's still illegal in, in several of their major cities. So it's not really an excuse, but I would just, my call to action would be awareness of this sector and awareness that the UK has not missed the boat. For me, that's a huge thing to try and get across. And we should be, my background in Williams Advanced Engineering and so forth, I've seen how great this country is at developing technology, sustainable transport in this sector. And I really want to encourage everyone to pay attention to it and find ways to support or to get involved in it and to, and to push it forward. And that, I think the last slide is probably just my email address again, um, not knowing the delegates on the call. Fab. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you, Oscar. Um, OK, so do you think it's likely to become legalized? Huh, yeah, this question is comes up a lot. It's not really my not really my job to answer. But yes, I think it's by accident rather than than design that it's illegal. And actually, it's a really good thing because it's meant that the DFT has been able to introduce it in a way that doesn't damage people's lives. In Europe, we saw chaos as scooters mm -hmm. started to come in. Whereas actually over here, 
these quite pragmatic trials have started. And I think that will reduce the friction. And I think that overall, if you take the long term, the 10 year view, that will improve the uptake in this country. So it will become legal is my my guess and in a better way than it would have done if it already was. Okay, and any any comments on the high accident rate? Uh, okay, so I can get myself into trouble here, so I'll be a little careful. From our analysis, mm -hmm. they have a reputation for a high accident rate, but if you eliminate first-time riders, about 40% of those accidents disappear. So first-time riders mm -hmm. take care. Secondly, if you take the remaining little propor proportion, about 60 to 70% of those are people who are riding in an inappropriate manner, we'll call it, on the pavement or, 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 or in a way which you would say that's going to lead to an accident. So when you actually compare apples with apples, you end up with quite a low accident rate. But I don't deny the reputation is pretty bad. OK, thank you. OK, so um, we move on to the next presentation, uh, which is by myself. Um, so on behalf of the Future Flight Challenge, I will share a brief presentation on the role of aviation and in particular future flight uh, in sustainable transport. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, thank you. So the global aviation industry produces around 2% of CO2 uh, emissions and therefore we have a key role in, in uh, reaching uh, net zero uh, emissions target by, by 2050. So the Future Flight Challenge can help reach these ambitions, but uh, how? Well, the Future Flight Challenge aims to revolutionize the way people, goods and services fly by accelerating the development of future air mobility solutions, which includes electric and autonomous flight. The 300 million four-year program is jointly funded by the UK government and industry and will inspire the next generation of sustainable aviation. Next slide, please. Thank you. So the Future Flight Challenge will create and demonstrate the aviation system that will enable the safe integration and operation of new types of air vehicles, including drones, advanced air mobility, which I'll explain a bit uh, more on later on, and sub-regional aircraft. It will demonstrate capabilities to improve UK connectivity regionally, provide solutions to congestion and transportation worldwide, whilst accelerating solutions for zero emission ambitions in the sector. Next slide, please. So we're on the cusp of what's being called the third revolution in aviation. Um, and I'll explain what that means. So it, the first aviation revolution uh, got us airborne with the Wright brothers. The second enabled us to fly intercontinentally with the advent of the jet age. And now the third, uh, will open up the skies to new classes of air vehicles with novel technologies. These new generation, this new generation of aviation uh, will incorporate uh, multiple classes of air vehicles and will bring flexibility, connectivity and accessibility to air transport. We will see drones, advanced air, mo air mobility vehicles, um, uh, which refers to air mobility, not just for urban areas, but also for rural and remote areas, as well as small electric hydrogen and hybrid propulsion aircraft, all operating in concert with, with each other in modernized airspace. We are unlocking emerging and disruptive technologies in fields such as artificial intelligence, robotics, autonomy, digital and energy storage, including battery technology, as we heard earlier, and um, which are all key enablers to transport, uh, to, to, to transform air transport, air transport. Okay, so I'll move to the next slide, please. Thank you. So feature flight can provide significant socioeconomic benefits for us. And um, there's an increasing plethora of diverse applications that can transform our lives. We see drones that can be used for offshore inspection, surveying after natural disasters, surveillance for blue, blue light services, um, here, uh, medical delivery, cargo, remote inspection, um, farming, um, scientific research, data gathering, uh, serving and mapping after a natural disaster, like, like I've mentioned. We also see larger unmanned air vehicles that can be used to deliver cargo or humanitarian aid or even vaccines in hard to reach areas. And these can be um, uh, uh, elect electric and um, remotely piloted or uh, fully uh, autonomous. We also see advanced air mobility vehicles, 
Um, and these vehicles are sometimes referred to as air taxis, but they can be used for other applications. Um, as we see here for emergency services, search and rescue operations, for intercity transit, intracity transit as well, rural air transport, and also to access uh, remote areas. So these are electric vertical takeoff and landing uh, vehicles. They can be piloted or more advanced um, by being automate, having automated and uh, autonomous capabilities. Um, and this would help eliminate pilot error and operate, help it operate in harsh weather um, in more advanced stages of the technology development. We also see a hydrogen powered um, electric or hybrid sub-regional aircraft that are small conventional takeoff and landing aircraft um, that can make use of remote or underused airfields to better connect us um, uh, across regions. So I'll move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. So the vision. So what do we see as the vision for, for future flight and for transport? We see these technologies being integrated into other forms of transport. Um, we, we see this as being sustainable, having sustainable transport solutions, bringing more consumer choice, increased convenience, seamless journeys, um, reduced journey time, reduced congestion, improving connectivity and accessibility, like I've mentioned, and a modernized transport uh, system. Now, there are many challenges um, to, to resolve. I'll move on to the next slide, please. And these challenges include a lack of digital infrastructure, uh, the lack of physical infrastructure um, in terms of charging points, um, hydrogen storage, um, regulations and certification. We have a saturated air traffic management system that is not scalable and unable to cope with increased volumes of air vehicles entering these airspace. So we need to, we need to resolve this. Um, and uh, it's, we also need to um, resolve the public perception and building public trust in these new types of, of aviation. So a lot of challenges to resolve that will require uh, coll collaboration. So move on to the next slide, please. So we're tackling these challenges with collaborative projects. We're bringing together innovators, policymakers, city planners, radical and disruptive technologies, new business models, and stakeholders in this across diverse sectors uh, to deliver this. Um, and we're working with world-class operators of airports, including Heathrow Airport, London City Airport, uh, Highland and Islands Airports, so all across the UK. We're bringing a wide range of customers of emerging markets in different areas, like I've highlighted search and rescue, local services, inspection, and more um, together, including all NHS. Um, and we're, we're convening transport integration specialists to integrate with road, road and rail and air for the first time. So we're, we've, got, we've got a lot of challenges, like I've mentioned, to resolve, um, but we can only do this with uh, um, uh, innovation and collaboration. I'll move on to the next slide, please. So in the phase of the project that we are in now, we have a diverse portfolio of 48 projects that are in progress. Um, we are tackling the integration challenges um, uh, with, by, um, with our funding. We have projects that, uh, that we are funding um, uh, that is supporting the NHS and emergency services in the wake of COVID, of the pandemic. We're investing in future air mobility and technologies that will allow full electric flight uh, in the UK for these small uh, aircraft. We're addressing these challenges and the wider aviation system um, that will help us advance and move towards uh, more sustainable air transport. I'll move to the next slide, please. So um, technology development in aerospace and aviation is incremental. And because of the high standards for safety, um, it takes time. So there isn't a way to leapfrog from where we are currently to a zero emission long range uh, uh, flight or operation. We must take incremental steps to achieve this. And this diagram here highlights um, that flight path that we must take to move from where we are now with general aviation and um, the, with the work that we're doing with drones, with advanced air mobility, um, and how we will progress to uh, sub-regional aircraft and then larger aircraft. Drones aren't represented on this diagram here, but we see it as the vanguard for, um, for advanced air mobility and other uh, um, transport solutions. Because once we can prove 
the technologies, once we can resolve these challenges with regulation, safety, infrastructure, technology, security, uh, public perception, then we can move the mark and then we can prove, uh, prove the technology, build public trust, um, and then we can move the mark again. So uh, it's, it's important for us to understand the, the, the flight path that it will take to move from where we are now to um, a sustainable, uh, sustainable air transport in the future and to help us understand how we can reach our net zero targets. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, so now um, we've got quite a few questions that's come through. Um, okay, so I'll, uh, I'll start picking out some of the questions and move to our panelists to, to answer some of them. Okay, so um, this question is for Evelyn. Now, has, has any work been done to compare the energy carbon footprint and air quality of EV car club against the traditional modes of transport? So I'm not sure about specifically for the EV car club side, but um, there's a great charity called um, Como UK, a national UK charity, and they do look at reports on how car clubs generally in, uh, have a different impact to just your like traditional uh, car journey. So um, uh, they had found, I'd brought up the report just in case. Um, so they found that actually for all the car clubs, which don't necessarily include EVs, there was something like 43% less CO2 emissions um, across the UK in 2019-20. And I'll stop my answer there. <laughs> I don't know the, the full answer, unfortunately. Okay, and so how much cost increase would there be for a domestic energy bill to charge an EV at home? I'm not sure if you have some insights on yeah, so it totally depends on how much miles you're doing with your car, right? So um, if you've got, if you're driving 10,000 miles per year, then that's roughly um, 2,500 kilowatt hours that would be added on to your, to your bill. So if uh, you're being charged 17 pence per kilowatt hour, that's about 425 pounds in a year. So that could go up and down depending on your mileage, um, but also that's 425 pound in a year compared to you know the cost of, of petrol or diesel um which would be a lot higher <laughs> i can imagine and um, and so how long do you propose the demonstrator project will run for and does it aim to scale up further yeah so i apologies i should have said that community energy scotland is only one of six partners within the, Re the reflex orkney project okay. um other partners are um emec aquaterra sms um harriet watt university and the, the orkney islands council and part of the project is looking at replication um mm. so it's a, a four-year part um funded project um so that will bring us to march 2023 um mm -hmm. and we are looking at uh potential replication opportunities. So, so if you're interested, please um, do email me or um, we've got the Reflex Orkney website and you can get in touch uh, that way as well. Okay, fantastic, thanks. And um, Dan, uh, a question for you. So um, does the carbon emissions for rail include infrastructure such as rails, ballast, cabling, for signaling and construction? Uh, yeah, good question. So on the graph that I showed in my presentation, it was for vehicles only. Uh, so, so the answer is no, but I think, you know, the general, the general message would be the same, even if we were to include infrastructure, you know, we could double, double the figure to include infrastructure, those general message would still be that rail is very green uh, compared to other modes. Okay, and um, what effect do you think electrification of rail would have on the national grid? Do we have the capacity for this, or if not, would new infrastructure be required? Yeah, so electrification, it will be a it will be a gradual process between now and mm -hmm. 2050. We're not going to have sort of one day where we just uh, switch everything over. So it will, you know, it gives it time to adapt and uh, and change. And in addition, electrification is becoming it's becoming more efficient. Uh, for example, we we're procuring more trains with regenerative braking, so uh, they require less. Uh, electricity in the first place or energy in the first place. And um, we're also seeing a transition to renewable sources as well, which I, I just thought was important to mention. So hopefully we'll, uh, uh, you know, we'll see improvements through that side as well. 
Okay, and uh, a question that's coming specifically for, for you. Um, with freight diesel units running into the megawatt scale or power demand, um, are UKRI looking at the work under bays for EMR as some of these reactor designs are deplo deployable and in the three to four megawatt scale? Currently, um, some of these designs are already being considered for shipping um, mm. and they are completely benign and safe, so those seem to be, to be great. Um, uh, so, do you have any comments on um, uh, this, this option? Yeah, thank you. So, quite a detailed, quite a detailed yeah. question. So, uh, AMRs are advanced modular reactors. So, this is, uh, I think, as the question says, in reference to nuclear. Uh, we're aware of this work that is being undertaken and of its potential in rail. I think at the moment it would be fair to say that, you know, hydrogen and battery uh, are the sort of the, the, the main predominant options beyond electrifications, but there's no but there's no reason why we should be constraining ourselves to just those. And if nuclear is the better option, then we should definitely be looking at that as well. And I've actually uh, you know, had a conversation with someone uh, in the industry last week about this very thing. So uh, it's a very, very topical question. Um, and we do feel that, yeah, there's definitely a space for the nuclear if it is you know, safe and uh, financially uh, feasible. And so, how long before um, we have widespread hydrogen trains, and what are the key barriers um, preventing this? How long? Wow, <laughs> putting me on the spot there. Is I think uh, we've through first of a kind 2020, which is one of the competitions we run on behalf of Department for Transport. Uh, we funded Hydroflex, which is the UK's uh, first uh, mainline uh, train. Um, in, which is uh, a University of Birmingham project. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, that's the first trial on the, on the UK mainline for a hydrogen train, uh, which is great to see, but of course there's quite a big step to now go to rolling that out to passenger services. It's going to be a number of years. We're not, you know, we're not able to get there immediately. Um, and there still needs to be work done to make, you know, to have hydrogen available, uh, as and when needed and where needed um, in, in terms of the infrastructure, et cetera, as well. So I'm afraid I don't think I can give a definite day or a year that we can uh, we can see it. But yeah, we're, work, we're working towards it. OK, and um, a question that I think we all associate with the, with rail um, affordability and cost. So <laughs> getting more people to use trains rather than cars is clearly important for, to reduce um, emissions. Um, uh, but the cost is, is the elephant in the room. Um, so uh, um, uh, the question uh, states that it should cost far less for a family to get the train to the nearest city than it does to drive. But that's not the case at the moment. Do you have any comments or feedback? Uh, we want sustainable travel, but we also need <laughs> as, uh, affordable travel. Yeah, exactly. I 100% agree, to be honest. Um, you know, we need to, I, I mentioned it in my presentation, but we need to make rail attractive. If we, it, it's difficult to tell, or it's difficult to try to convince people to switch to greener alter alternatives if those alternatives aren't um, affordable or at least on par with current options, because, uh, you know, it's it, why would people change a habit of a lifetime? And, and it's not just rail that has that problem as well. It's the same as Evelyn mentioned with um, electric cars or electric vehicles. You know, move, it, it's important to try and get people to uh, to make a change. I mean, to do that, you need to incentivize it and make it attractive. And that become that comes through pricing, but it also be through uh, the sort of some of the peripheral options as well, like making rail just an enjoyable way to travel emphasizing that you can you can work whilst you're traveling or you can read a book or you can you know there's lots of options of things you can do you can't do whilst you're driving for example yeah. so but so to come back to the question yes i agree uh, of course the last year has shown that it's a bit difficult um, because of financial impact of covid and the government's put in a lot of money into rail so there does need to be some sort of costs reduced or finances returned to government to afford that but yeah, let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. In terms of a sustainable alternative to trans to travel, with um, rail being that, 
I guess we'll also have, it would just be another option as we see advances in um, electric technology for cars. Because if we've got electric cars as well, um, we're also, rail would be another sustainable uh, option in terms of emissions. Yeah, exactly. And, and I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not stood here or sat here sort of saying that rail should be the only option. I think it's got to be part of a transport uh, system and, mm. and it's part of the, considering the first mile and last mile, we need to have scooters and bikes and walking and, um, and yeah, electric cars and, and rail should be part of that. Okay. And so um, what vehicle ownership assumptions underpin the electricity and battery? Uh, demand calculations. It's assumed. Is it assumed that vehicle ownership will continue to grow, or are there assumptions around decarbonisation based upon reducing the need to travel and mode shift? Is that another question for me, or is uh, yes. perhaps one? Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, so, I, sorry. Just to come back to the question, I think it was around. Um, Underpinning yeah. electric battery demand calculations, yeah. Um, yes, that's right. Um, mm -hmm. Because now we'll see with COVID a, sh a shift in the way we travel, a, a, a shift in um, uh, um, the need the need to travel. So, uh, do, do these calculations take into account? Um, sure. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I believe they do. I mean, obviously, you know, the COVID is still relatively uh, it's a relatively new thing. We don't entirely know the impact going forwards. Um, it's worth mentioning as well that the Williams Rail Review or Williams Shatz Rail Review will be published this week by government and uh, will, that will likely shed some light on um, sort of various reform within industry and it's, it's very difficult to know but what all of these changes are going to have in terms of the patronage going forwards and, and, and you know how this affects uh, number of rail passengers but also all of the external factors such as vehicle ownership of uh, of cars etc so uh, mm -hmm. it's probably difficult to give a, a hard answer to that yeah understand. okay so um my next question is for uh Oyepula. so is there any focus on the recycling of batteries yeah i'm sorry about that i was on mute <laughs> right. yeah um Yes, there is a lot of focus around um, recycling at the moment. Um, within the Faraday Battery Challenge, we have quite a number of um, projects that are looking into recycling. Mm -hmm. um, we know that um, ensuring sustainable supply chain is critical. It's complex. It's a complex situation. Mm -hmm. um, We're working together with other departments, um, government departments as well, to understand and bring together uh, an appropriate um, stakeholder to mm -hmm. look into these um, aspects of recycling. But like I said, there are quite a number of um, projects within um, Faraday Battery Challenge. In Faraday Institution, we have a really um, project that are looking into um, battery recycling as, uh, as well. And this involves a range of universities looking at the research um, side of it, the, um, recycling. And the aim of the project is to recycle 100% of the battery. And okay. the project will also be looking at how to reuse the battery and the materials mm -hmm. and to make better use of global resources, as well as improve the impact of battery in improving hair quality and decarbonization. So yes, and within the um, collaborative research um, research as well, we have the Calibre project looking into um, uh, a way they, they have, so they have a vision of creating a safe and um, economical, um, sustainable battery recycling supply chain in the UK. Um, yeah, so quite a lot of projects are looking into that, and um, we're beginning to see um, technologies and innovation coming through. Okay, and are there other battery solutions or technology being researched beyond lithium ion? Yeah, very good question. Um, yes, there are. And um, within the Friday Battery Challenge um, project as well, we do have um, the Regalera uh, Faridion looking into sodium ion. Mm -hmm. And the interest is um, the sodium ion is an interesting one as we're looking at lower cost option. And we do have a project as well looking into sodium um, 
the um, solid state batteries as well. And the advantage of that is for the energy density and potential um, safety as well. So mm -hmm. beyond um, lithium, yes, there are a number of projects looking into other solutions and other technology. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, and so uh, do you think battery electrification is the answer to our net zero target? Hmm. That, 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 <laughs> that's an um, interesting question. Um, I would say it depends on the application. Mm -hmm. yeah. However, majority of um, automotive applications obviously will require battery, mm -hmm. uh, which is more common among them. But, but for other applications, maybe for like heavy duty, freight, aerospace, it will not be the solution, but it will be part of the solution. So okay. I would say that battery will not be the answer for all things, uh -huh. but it will be quite important. Okay, okay, thank you, thanks. Um, so Oscar, um, a question for you on e-scooters um, e and e-bikes. What do you think, where do you think uh, research and innovation in the UK should focus to improve e-scooter and e-bike for micromobility? That is a really good question. And I guess, where do I think the UK should focus first, more than anything? Mm. Uh, difficult one to unpackage, but one of the issues is that because it's created so many headlines, the industry is looked at over quite a short frame. People think of it over the last three years from when it appeared in Santa Monica and it was mm -hmm. a mired magazine and everyone was really excited through to today. And if you slightly shift your view and you look at the next 10 years, 20 years, and you look at this as like early automotive. So, so, you know, 1902, there were like, you know, five automotive manufacturers. By 1930, there had been a, a lift up to like, at its peak, 1200 automotive manufacturers, and then it died back down to three or four. This industry, it seems very pragmatic to say, is going to go through the same cycle where it will explode. And at the moment, the heat of that explosion is in China and it's starting to spread out a little bit. The UK, by deploying its abilities in innovation and in, in, in advanced sustainable, can have a huge impact in any element of the vehicle or in the infrastructure or in the networking of them or in how they... So, so really, I think I would go back to my original point, which is awareness. I would be happy to see the UK deploying itself at any element of it. Um, Clearly, with everything that the, the, the guys have been saying, for example, what Dan's comment, we could become the leaders in last mile, first mile integration into wider transport networks. We could yeah. become the leaders in the battery technology uh, and uh, you, you integrating some of the, what the, the sodium ion, some of what Faraday's working on. I just really want to see the UK focusing on, on, on any element of this industry and taking a lead in it. Mm, OK, thanks. Um, and so I'll ask an open question to the panel uh, then. So where... Where does the panel think um, will have the biggest impact on decarbonizing travel in the UK? <laughs> so uh, it's uh, one vote for each element. Oscar, since your mic is off, <laughs> uh, if you've got any comments, and then I'll ask the other. I would there. unpackage that. So, for example, the technologies Dan's talking about clearly have the ability to massively decarbonize big intercity travel but probably yeah. won't have a huge impact on the urban environment. Um, improvements in, in battery technology, they're going to decarbonize everything because they enable, um, they enable uh, you know, uh, renewable energy storage and they, they, so, so they can have a huge impact across the board. When you get into car share, you know, from my point of view, micro mobility is going to impact our cities. People are moving to the cities. And so for me, every step we can take to improve the energy efficiency and, and the local pollution created by urban transport is a huge positive. So I, I think micro mobility is going to be one of the biggest forces over the next 10 or 20 years on all of our lives. Uh -huh. Okay, and Dan, can I ask you, can I pick on you as a, a real representative to, uh, to comment on, you know, what do you think will have the biggest impact on decarbonizing travel in the UK? Yeah, uh, no problem. So, I, I mean, from a rail perspective, I don't want to sort of <laughs> just repeat, repeat the things I said in the presentation too much, but it's, it's really hard to pick one single thing, mm -hmm. uh, of course, um, but it's gonna be, it's about working 
it's about working as a transport system. So uh, being multimodal, thinking about the whole passenger journey, and it's also working beyond just transport. So working with the construction industry, for example, um, and and supply chain, and yeah, and sort of really trying to create a whole a uh, whole UK-wide approach to decarbonisation, not just picking one specific uh, element of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I see as we introduce more options for travel, so with the future, with future flight, we will see um, more and more travel move to the skies, where we have um, uh, maybe shorter hops with electric uh, air vehicles. Um, and by breaking that up, um, and having electric, solu uh, electric solutions, sustainable solutions, that would uh, help decarbonize as well. So you sort of, you see the multimodal integration of more transport options, uh, should we say, that will all add to, um, to, to build for that, for that ambition. Evelyn, can I ask you to come in? Because uh, with cars and what, what um, the, your project is doing, what do you think uh, will have the biggest impact on decarbonizing travel in the UK? So I actually um, have so many different ways that I want to answer this, but <laughs> I, first of all, I would say that, yeah, I agree. Whatever we're gonna have to do is gonna be a, have to be a whole system solution. One of the, the main things we haven't really spoken about too much is actually transportation of goods. So actually, I think shipping, you know, OK, fine, we're traveling in, in between the UK and, and people are moving around. But actually, how are we getting all of the goods that we need to live our lives? So I think a move um, to sort of decarbonize the shipping, but also actually a move towards more local um, produce, um, just generally not needing to travel far away. So actually, in some ways, the fact mm -hmm. we are having this webinar as a webinar, not in in a single place, I think that is going to have a massive impact on us decarbonizing just because we're not needing to, to travel as much. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, Oyebola, do you want to come in with any comments on um, what do you think will have the biggest impact on decarbonizing travel in the UK? Thank you very much. Um, just like I mentioned earlier in my, in, in my um, slide um, with regards to the different um, 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 different modes of transportation. It's, it's becoming really, really apparent that it's just not passengers cars. It has to be every other form of um, transport that we need to decarbonize, um, whether rail, um, passengers cars, air, everywhere. It has to be um, across board. So um, yeah. And because um, we're looking at different sectors coming on board, uh, different sectors will have different requirements and priorities. So yes, I would say everything, to be honest, not only passengers cars anymore, as it used to be. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and so uh, what's uh, one lesson um, that you've learned working around sustainable transport that you think everyone should know? Can I go first on that one? <laughs> um, I, I sort of mentioned them um, before, but Como UK are a UK charity that, that look at um, sort of promoting lots of different types of shared transport. Um, and I've discovered that in the, in the past year even. And I, I just think it's a really good source of information and just uh, another way of looking at transport rather than, oh, it's all mine. Um, and this like own, having to own the transport physically. Um, yeah, it's a great sort of community owned um, uh, sort of aspect to it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, does anyone else want to share That's, their thoughts? On just tying lessons? into what Dan said around quality of life on the train. And for me around e-scooters and even I think Evelyn will say with, with driving electric cars, Mm -hmm. The really important lesson I've learned is that it's more fun. I, I, I worry about the extent to which the, the, the or it's a better life. It, it, I worry about the extent to which the drum is banging for sustainability and so forth. But we can mm -hmm. actually align this to what people care about, which is have I had a great day? And you're riding an e-scooter across town, you get to see the city, you save time, you save money. Taking a train, you can work. You don't have to be concentrating on the road, which is such a waste of human time, life and effort. And equally, just driving an electric car, 
is more fun. They're, they're more responsive. They're, they're quieter. They're all of it. So, so from my point of view, it's slightly shifting the marketing behind it all is the one lesson I've learned to say, you're going to have a better life. This is going to improve your day um, over and above the fact that it's environmentally friendly, which is fantastic as well, obviously. Mm -hmm. I really agree. I really agree with Oscar as well. And, um, you know, it's more, in some ways, this is much more about, much more than just the technology. It's about changing behaviours and changing attitudes. Um, and you need to do that by making these things uh, attractive and sexy and affordable and, you know, all of these things that just saying uh, hydrogen is hydrogen's going to be cleaner or battery is going to be cleaner. It probably doesn't really do it for 99% of the population. So <laughs> you need to, uh, yeah, need to think about the, sort of the bigger picture and how we can uh, make people want to use these forms of transport. Uh, I don't know how you go it. about making hydrogen sexy, but <laughs> well, that's my my next question is how what what can we do to um, improve the public perception of these new technologies? I think there's there's a lot going on already. There is a demand for sustainable transport. We see climate change. There there is a demand, and especially with the new generation, and this is becoming more more and more important. So a demand for sustainable transport is there. Um, how do we bring the public on board and improve uh, their perception for these technologies, which are new, innovative, and just non, not traditional? Not everyone's going to want to hop on board, uh, like you said, uh, a micro mobility, um, uh, uh, an EV, or I know for autonomous aircraft. And um, so, what can we do to improve the public perception of, of, these, uh, of these new um, innovative ways to travel? Who was it who said bums on seats? Was it Evelyn said bums on seats? <laughs> bums on seats. We've seen the same thing. It's incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. For us, we, we see um, it's about building the public's trust in the technology. So it's not just about um, getting them to accept, but if we can demonstrate, if we can test and demonstrate a solution and we prove this is safe, then we move the mark move to the next step so this is what we're doing with them um, like i've said this incremental step change and not just a leapfrog for autonomous vehicles if we can start with drones and we can show that yes we can demonstrate beyond visual line of sight operation that is safe then we can think of advanced air mobility vehicles that's more automated once we can prove this then we can move towards um uh, autonomous operation so for us it's about making sure that we we bring the public along to see the um the the um solving these challenges at different different levels um i don't know if anyone else wants to to come on board with that with so for example with battery technology as well as you move as you move from smaller vehicles to larger vehicles once we can prove this and we're mindful of the narrative that we have around um these technologies i know especially for future flights whenever you think of an uh a uh, future flight vehicle, it's always, uh, you know, a narrative about um, um, some Hollywood blockbuster movie that had like drones for, 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 for bad things or for, for surveillance and this sort of thing. It's changing those narratives around uh, technology as well. We, we owe that to the public because they need to know, um, they need to be accessing uh, the right information as well. So it's, it's how do we, how do we, I guess, bring the public on board, make sure that we're involving them in the different stages where we prove safety with these technologies and how do we make sure that they're accessing the right information around these technologies as well. Um, okay, so, sorry, go ahead, Oscar, you wanted to come gonna, I, I mean, I do think awareness has an impact on that. And as it becomes more ubiquitous, as you know, even mo I weirdly, I feel like mobile phones have helped to improve people's confidence in EVs because we're so used to living with it in our pocket. And to that mm -hmm. end, I noticed your cool future picture, which was fantastic, had no scooters in it. And I'm wondering <laughs> whether this is an active dig or whether <laughs> We'll have to integrate it um, yeah. into our next nice our vision. Can I can I just add uh, one final mm -hmm. thing as well? I completely agree. It is there's definitely a sort of a culture change element and making people, you know, through through both push and pull factors, making people uh, move to greener alternatives and, and net, mm -hmm. net zero options, whether that's like policy and pricing, um, mm -hmm. 
for example. But then I think there's also an element that, for, at least in rail, you know, does someone care, or do, for the majority of the population maybe, do they care whether they're on a diesel train or an electrified train? Do they even know whether they're on a diesel or an electrified train for the journey, you know, between London and Bristol or wherever it may be? Uh, I think possibly the answer is no. And so there's a, certainly an element where we have to make these decisions um, and we have to proceed and do it. And hopefully the outcome is that uh, it leads to greener travel. Perhaps the public isn't even aware that that's happening. Um, so just something to think about. Yeah, I would actually like to counter that slightly because while yes, there might be times when you do just need to take decisions, you have to engage the public. Like mm. just saying that's how you have to travel, go and do it that way isn't gonna, no, nobody's going to really respond to that very well and actually just find out what the needs are you know like we assume that okay you need an electric car to do that but but do you is there a better way would a train be better would um a, a short flight or or a a scooter be a, be a better option in that what you know it is changing that and i think we just really need to engage the public and be honest about um things that are going you know um we haven't figured out the most efficient way to get from A to B, um, but that didn't stop us, you know, putting wheels on on carts, you know, to shift stuff around. So um, just that, be honest, you know, we haven't got the solution yet. It is an ongoing thing, as, as yeah. has all human endeavours, really. <laughs> and just to add a little bit to that as well, in terms of the electric vehicle, you know, just reassuring people about the sustainability of the materials and making sure creating that awareness that there is a lot of research around sustainable materials, not only cobalt from Congo and stuff like that, that UK is also looking into how we ensure even the end of life of the batteries at the end of you know the life, what are we doing about that? Are mm -hmm. we what are we looking into making sure that there is that recycling going on? So a lot of people are concerned about that, what happens at the end. But there mm. is a lot of research going on in terms of understanding what we need to do at that stage. So mm. creating that um, sort of um, confidence and awareness in the heart of people help, will help yeah. as well. Agreed. Thank you. So I feel like we can continue this conversation, but I'm conscious of time. But um, so I'll just uh, I'll just add my thoughts. But I, Dan, I do think there's a culture shift. I think Gen Z will disagree. <laughs> um, so there is a culture shift for sustainable everything and um, uh, sustainable travel. We want to um, we 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 need to address um, climate change. There is a culture shift towards this, and it's going to become increasingly important with uh, this new generation. But also there's a culture shift for convenience. There's a, a culture of hyper convenience, shorter journey times. And uh, we wanna be able to book or travel on an app. We wanna be able to get on our micro scooter and get to the train station, get on our electric um, train and hop onto an autonomous EV toll that takes us somewhere else. And so there's that culture shift for sustainability as well as hyper convenience as well. We also want to have our battery powered um, drone deliver our Amazon package and our prescription medication to our door, for example. So there, there's a huge culture shift, um, I think. And we need to make sure that we bring the public on board. We make sure that it's accessible and affordable for everyone so that we're not leaving any particular communities or um, uh, any particular communities or demographics uh, behind. So with, with, with that, I'll ask the panelists to share any final uh, comments or feedback or insight. Just thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for this opportunity. And I'll be happy to, for anyone to reach, reach out to me if they would like any more information about Faraday. Okay, thank you. I also saw a comment from someone who, as a Gen Z, welcome anything that can be done with sustainability. And we'll take we have an actual Gen Z. Gen Z. Yeah. <laughs> so that's perfect. Okay, so thank you. I'll thank all of my panelists for a great discussion um, on sustainable transport. Um, you have their contact details. That was at the end of the slide. And um, our, I'll ask our audience to join us for our next webinar in this series, which is on the 15th of June, on sustainable building. So please visit the UKRI website to find out more. Thank Thanks, you all. Thanks, Carissa. It's been great. Thanks.